The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the GALA webinar series. My name is Manuela Noske, and I'm the Communications Manager at GALA. GALA is a global nonprofit trade association that enables communication and business across languages and cultures. We are headquartered in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. Today, Dorotha Carrillo from Philips will talk to us about the role of localization in new product development. We will kick this off in just a moment, but before I do that, I need to go over our housekeeping items. Everyone finds a muted to cut down on any noise. If you have any technical difficulties, let me know by using your chat box and I will work with you to troubleshoot them. If you have a slow internet connection, your audio may be disrupted. If that happens, you can use the number listed on the GoToWebinar panel to call in using your own phone. We are making a recording of this presentation and you will be able to find it following the presentation on GALA's global website. All participants will receive a link if you have any questions or comments, please type them into your chat box. We will get to as many questions as we can with the time remaining after the presentation. Next, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dorothy Carrillo currently manages localization for all of SonyCare apps at Philips for the connected line of toothbrushes. She was born and raised in Mexico, but as a journalism student, always had her eye on foreign lands and languages. Her travels and studies took her to places like France, Germany, and the United States, where she currently resides. She transitioned from journalism into translation and localization 10 years ago and has held a variety of roles in industries like court interpreting, video games, life sciences, software as a service, and IoT products. Dulce is a Certified Localization Project Manager, ECQA Advanced Terminology Manager, and a six, six, six Sigma Green Belt. A lifelong learner, she currently, uh, she's currently a Technical Communication and Localization Master's Candidate at the University of Strasbourg in France. And now, without any further ado, Dulce, take it away. All right. Um, can anybody, can everybody hear me? Okay. I can hear you all right. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Manuela, for the presentation, the introduction. Um, yeah, so um, I, this, this was my master's thesis, so it's, it's repurposed for this webinar. And um, yeah, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about uh, innovation and new product development and how they relate to the localization profession. All right. Next. Um, I don't want to bore you to death with more details about me, but um, I guess you should know that I have worked very closely with product teams uh, in the past 10 years uh, within engineering um, and also in QA, uh, so, so very, very close to product development, whether it was uh, software uh, for video games or a medical device, and uh, I, I started gathering a lot of insights from all these teams that were working together, uh, gathering requirements from marketing and making decisions on what the next value proposition or the new next product would be. Um, and you might ask, uh, so if I'm a linguist or most of my background is in translation, uh, what does this have to do with product development and innovation since for most of us, we're typically at the end of the release cycle, right? It, it, unless you're fortunate and lucky to work for a company that uh, has the globalization gene figured out, most of us are usually playing catch up and um, trying to make do with whatever content, uh, source content we have and, and localizing it to the best of our abilities. So during my, my research for my thesis, I really wanted to focus on how you know, you know uh, I guess we'll define innovation first. So innovation, the way I see it and um, in this context and uh, for new product development means when a company is trying to launch, whether it's a new feature for an existing product or they're implementing a new service, um, you know, like for those that are working in uh, enterprise research management type software um, or introducing new capabilities to uh, services like Amazon is adding more languages and uh, they're doing different things, 
hosting data, you know, it's a new new business capability. Or just thinking of ways to attract customers, right? Like Uber launching uh, Uber Eats uh, versus just doing right right here. Next. All right. So um, I started looking from from starting from my from where I was at, right? I was managing localization projects and 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 thinking, how do I feed back? How do I work back upstream so that I can influence uh, the decision makers, so that my job and the quality of my work is better? And I noticed across all the different companies that I worked and through other peers that shared their knowledge, uh, that a lot of the companies were really struggling with making localization and content teams a part of the development. So we were always trying to understand a feature after the fact um, and then getting feedback maybe from the markets where they were saying, you know, this doesn't apply, our healthcare system works in a different manner, so maybe this feature only makes sense in the US. Um, and so we just started collecting all these ideas for, okay, well, if we're in the quest for localization maturity, um, and, and maybe I should mention for, for some of you, if you're not familiar with the maturity model from CSA, uh, they describe all the stages that a company uh, goes through in the quest of localization maturity. Um, it's The framework is borrowed from the software maturity model that uh, Carnegie Mellon University Engineering University uh, came up with many many years ago. I think it was in the 90s. Um, so, so yeah. So we were we were trying, you know, at our uh, at my company back then, uh, trying to explain to stakeholders, okay, so if we're trying to get better at our job as localizers, let's look at all the things that we could be doing better. And one of those is understanding the features better and the products better. And that was also taking us into how are they developed. Um, yeah, so one of the one of the key things that a lot of my colleagues and I found out was that for the most part, content and localization were always seen as a transactional activity that was happening in a black box. So the designers would be creating the UI and they would be gathering uh, input from user research, but the user research was probably focused only on the US uh, because it was expensive to get it from um, international uh, or global audiences and they were seeing they were failing to see the connection between innovation and global readiness uh, we we had a few issues in one of the products i worked at where um, the the feature again one of those where the feature was developed based on the size of a patient uh for, you know a western male patient and uh and then when it was translated it just wasn't making sense for you know Asian counterparts that were much smaller and just different weight and different sizes. Um, so yeah, so some of these algorithms and fancy features that get developed in the first world sometimes don't apply to other uh, areas in the world. So uh, that was another another pattern we started noticing as we were looking into the types of uh, how how features were prioritized for products and product launches across. Uh, product lines. And so this is where, where I ended up doing a little bit more deep dive into, okay, so how, how do companies go about doing innovation, right? Like typically are they engineer, you know, we all hear there are engineers, they come up with an idea, they typically um, write a patent and then, you know, they go about testing it, experimenting and then developing it. And it turns out that there is, there are two main approaches already uh, that have been identified by business schools. And with the main one that I found uh, that is mostly used is localization, which is probably the framework that most of us work in. So it's, it's really looking at uh, innovations that, that start in a first world country. So let's say the US or maybe France or Japan, you know, if you think about the, the G7 countries, right? the ones that have the most uh, projections for economical growth. So they would be the ones that are setting up the pace and the tone in terms of technology and, and what they're developing and how they're serving the Western countries first. And then there, you know, a lot of companies base their, their tiered uh, releases, especially when it comes on to um, manufacturing and things that require a little longer release time, right? And more, 
more uh, investment versus maybe launching software, um, software as a service on the cloud, right? That's easier to deploy typically. Um, so, so then there were these two, two approaches and reverse innovation by contrast was saying innovation happens everywhere. It's not just the first world countries that have ideas. It just maybe we weren't hearing about it and we don't often hear about it because it's handled differently. Um, yeah, next. All right, so here we can we can start seeing some of the, the, the differences between these two approaches. Glocalization really looks at the product um, and it comes up, you know, it, 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 it's product first and country second. And so this is where localization is always doing all these adaptations and maybe, maybe we even do some transcreation just to further adapt uh, strings or, or, or features to, for a user. And it really helps companies when they're starting out to be uh, in the quest for globalization. So maybe they're going for the first 10 countries, right? So this works great. Um, but it gets harder as, you know, once a company like the size of Philips or maybe a Microsoft, right? It's all about the emerging markets. And so how do you, how do you reach the emerging markets if the needs are very different? Um, so the, the most basic defect of localization is that it's assuming that all these rich markets and emerging markets are the same. And so the product that I can sell here, just to give you an example, maybe if I sell a television that has five buttons and, and you know, several features for the US, then it could just be, maybe we just remove three buttons and we launch it in India or in Mexico. And, and that approach is kind of like giving a, a watered down version of a product instead of actually giving a product that is relevant to that market. So that's, that's the focus of localization. Um, we can go to the next one. Uh, and, and before I forget, yeah. So the term reverse innovation was coined by uh, Chris Timble and BJ Govindarajan um, in 2005. Uh, Dr. Govindarajan actually worked for GE as their tech consultant for many, many years. And one of the, one of the, the key things he discovered is that this approach was not working. This, this watered down version of products and services was just not a good uh, business um, process and, and it wasn't paying off, right? So, so he started looking at typical uh, examples that were already out on the market of people doing reverse innovation. And uh, they set up, they basically decentralized the decision-making power that was happening uh, in US headquarters or in, in uh, first world headquarters. Um, and then they let, they, they created a small team in, um, in India where they started looking at uh, portable monitors for rural areas for um, pregnant women. And, and at first they got a lot of pushback from, you know, their counterparts in the US. Well, you're just creating, you know, things that nobody needs. And then now are we gonna have to localize from Hindi into like English? And then there's just all these ways we should have just started doing everything in English first and developed, you know, uh, in the US with all the existing processes. But it turned out that it was, it, it opened their their eyes to all the operational possibilities and it allowed them to then sell those monitors in the US for rural areas that also had this need. It just was never identified. So it's just an example of uh, reverse innovation and, and how it could work for a company, right? Um, so yeah, there, there's tremendous uh, need, as we were mentioning before, uh, user research is, is costly, right? And, and not a lot of companies can afford to do global or international user research. So what I proposed to my team back then is that then the localization person or team, you know, cause sometimes it's usually one person doing a million jobs, um, the terminology, the, the translation and everything, uh, so there's there's tremendous value in understanding your user base, right? And and sometimes the translation manager or the localization manager have direct access to all these country uh, managers or or reviewers around the world that have access to to talk to the to the customers daily or that interact with the markets. And so they gather this data and and sometimes nobody's asking them for it, right? So it, it would only make sense that maybe the localization 
uh, professional can also become a partner in the initial product development phases and, and value proposition um, development. And uh, as the internet user base grows and, and more customers expect more digital content to become available, it only makes sense that we keep this global readiness and, and developing global user personas in the, in the back of everyone's mind. Um, one of the other key things, and, and this, this resonates a lot with the two of the companies that I worked uh, recently for. So, uh, you know, Microsoft trying to do a lot of good work for uh, everybody to allow to do them the rest work. I believe their mission and statement goes somewhere along those lines. Um, and then Philips also, uh, one of their, their key tag missions is to, to enable a better life for I think it's 30 billion people um, by the year 2030. And so it really brings back uh, a bit of responsibility on all of us that touch a product on the way out to releasing it, right? Are we, are we creating a better society? Are we enabling people to do their best work, to, to have access to uh, their data, to whatever it is? Or are we forgetting about certain sections of the population uh, whereas that's uh, emerging markets, right? Or um, just different different users that maybe are not uh, paid attention or captured, or, or maybe the data is not being collected in the right way or presented to the, the development teams. So I, I do believe that localization professionals uh, can be really powerful allies in, in the product development and also in the wealth redistribution of the world because uh, you know, technology is shaping all of our lives, and and we have we have a, a tremendous responsibility, but also opportunity to to change uh, the course of things. All right, and so why should why should most of us care about uh, innovation? Right, we already have plenty to do. We have uh, terminology, uh, QA errors, translation errors. Um, it's just going back to 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 that the 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 availability of uh, roles for a localization professional get tend to be a little bit limited after a while, especially in in the life sciences. I know the tech the tech world has a little bit more uh, variety of roles, and, and I do believe that this will enable localization professionals to have access to to be partners and, and decision makers and and be part of writing requirements for the products and developing technology. Um, they will also guide decision making on which languages are prioritized because sometimes I've noticed that the, the decision making is very much uh, based on inertia. Well, these are the top tier countries, right? But when you really look at, uh, you know, maybe the revenue that's coming in from those countries or the active users that you have, um, you know, the revenue is just not there or the engagement is not there. And so it, the more we empower localization professionals to be giving back to the business and also challenging the business to make better decisions when, when we're developing services and products, um, the better it is for all of us, um, honestly. Right. And I might have gone too fast because <laughs> I'm running out of slides. <laughs> Um, so this probably will be the, the shortest web webinar ever, unless you have a lot of questions. Um, the, my, my conclusions are that uh, the, the companies, especially with everything that has been going on recently with a lot of tech companies, uh, I don't know if any of you follow, um, you know, what's happening with, the, with data and privacy laws and uh, GDPR. Uh, the, the global companies that succeed in, in the future will be cor good corporate citizens that take time to respect and understand the, the needs of each local market and, and user. And um, when I worked in video games, one of the things that really bothered me was I would hear um, you know executives refer to certain languages as, oh, those are in the third tier language. You know, that we don't make a lot of money, we're just going after them for market presence. And honestly, it, you know that's just not it's not it's not a good uh, approach to treating your users like they're second class citizens um i think we have we have a responsibility to talk to them about you know 
okay, maybe if they're not bringing in revenue, then let's look at why. Are we not localizing the content the right way? Are we not giving them relevant features? Um, are we not giving them relevant products? And it goes back to the product development, right? It's not just all of us becoming a, a machine to translate and to churn out content just for the sake of it. And lastly, I mean, why do we want to do this? Because I do believe that, uh, you know, all of us deserve a good user experience and, and you know, interacting with a product or a feature and not feeling like, like it was last minute or, or uh, an afterthought. Right, and yeah, I think that was probably the fastest webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank you, Dulce. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the floor is open uh, for questions from the audience. Um, let me start, uh, you know, with this one, like what, so let's assume I am a motivated log professional, you know, who believes in everything that you say. How can I concretely help in my role? Let's say I'm a localization project manager. What can I do? How can I go about this? So I would say you start uh, talking to the people who are writing the requirements typically. So if, if you're in a, in a software um, uh, field, you talk to the person who's maybe writing the user stories and, or the product owner or the product manager, and you really try to first understand uh, what is the mission of your brand? What is the mission of your product? What is the ultimate? And then, then you can work to become a better ally to say, how can we make this product better long-term? And can, you know, are there any emerging markets you would like to target and why? Why do you want to go there? And let's, let's look at and validate assumptions instead of just becoming a transactional space where they're like, I need translations. Okay, here they are. It's more of a, a two-way street where you're, you're having, you're enabling this conversation to happen and, and, and for the business to see you as a real contributor instead of just a call center, right? Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and so we have um, a number of questions here now. Uh, so how do you really encourage localization innovation in product design? How do you go about that? So I think you have to start by by cleaning up house first, right? So so what we were talking about the, the maturity model. Um, you first have to get all your, your you know, herd all your cats and get all your content right. And as you're doing that, the way you're engaging and educating internally is going to allow you to each time maybe get a little bit more uh, influence. And so you might say, okay, so I noticed that the Japanese um, and the Russians, um, uh, you know, our colleagues are very always very motivated to do in country reviews. Uh, they're just, they really want to see this feature. And so you can start engaging them and say, is there anything else you would like to see? Because nine times out of 10, uh, they're not being heard, right? They feel like they're so disconnected from headquarters or from the decision makers um, that they, you know, you're almost like their ally and their representative. Um, and so I just, I just find that asking people other questions aside from, hey, is the translation done or can you review it faster? Um, you know, what, what else is there? What do you see? Um, just, and, and it takes, honestly, maybe you set up regular check-ins once a month and you pick, you know, two countries maybe, um, and you just start asking questions and, and you'll be amazed at what you can learn and, and how you can become part of the innovation uh, team in your company. Mm -hmm. And I think a few people would also like to get clear on what you really mean by reverse innovation. And, you know, it would be great if you maybe could provide a couple of examples of successful reverse innovation. Um, and then, you know, how did this work? You know, you, you mentioned, well, do we have to localize from Hindi to other languages to which the answer would be yes. Uh, could you could you share a few success stories? Right. So I believe Dell uh, also launched uh, a successful reverse innovation uh, example, and I think they actually published it on their blog. Um, I, I see if I can get the, the link to see if, if anybody's interested. Um, but they 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 basically were looking also at how costly it was to deploy solutions going through the traditional push model of um, the U.S. or or uh, France or Japan pushing out, okay, our businesses are at this level of maturity. And so, you know, our enterprise uh, users typically need this amount of features or uh, computers available, um, 
I don't know. And then and then they were trying to sell that those same solutions in India and in Mexico and in Brazil, and it just wasn't working. And and they just would get cancellation on their um, contracts, and they just couldn't figure out why. And then finally, they decentralized uh, decision making, and they said, okay, we're gonna give, we're gonna create a pilot project, and we're gonna let a team. Um, just kind of figure out what the local market in, in India uh, needs. I, I believe that's where they also deployed it. Um, and it turned out that they just needed, you know, lighter computers and uh, they needed uh, batteries that lasted a little longer uh, because people were spending longer commutes and, the, you know, they just didn't have access to electricity. Um, it just you know, different things and maybe sometimes we're so constricted by the way we're doing things that we forget that that, that there are specific needs to other countries. So reverse innovation is trying to say, stop create like there's there's a lot of operational leverage that happens when you create something uh, and then you try to just copy it and then maybe water it down as you deploy it in emerging markets. So how about instead you go through the emerging market? You you do both. So it, what most companies that have tried this said is oftentimes globalization will create the revenue needed to create reverse innovation pilot projects. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I don't know if I can, that cleared it up, but if it made it more money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and just to, to add that on, I believe that, uh, though I, I'm not sure what the localization story was, but uh, Vijay uh, Govindarajan, he has a, a really good TED talk out uh, in which he talks about reverse innovation. And a few of the examples that he gives in there is a, a, a portable defibrillator, which kind of plays into, you know, your your role, uh, because you've been working in the life sciences, uh, you know, that uh, that was developed in India, highly portable and cheap, uh, that ultimately uh, was brought to first world or developed countries or global north countries you know and uh and have really been helpful there as well because a regular defibrillator is is you know is is a difficult object to operate uh, and this was just a lightweight solution so um that was you know it's just one more example of what reverse innovation means and how people can work with it um right. So, you know, we have both people from, uh, you know, LSPs as well as people from client organizations uh, on the call. And somebody here is asking, and I think it's it's a good question, well, what can you do when you work in an LSP? Um, so, honestly, I've had I've had great, great teams uh, on the LSP side that were also, you know, as, as you as as a project manager or a terminologist, um, they're reviewing our content and they're asking questions that are in terms of the content, um, the key, trying to understand features, right? So, so that's typically the interaction. But then we would go through the quarterly business review, right? And they would often ask like, okay, well, how are the services going? Is there anything else we could provide you with? Mm -hmm. And honestly, at some point I would just, I would say, okay, you have access to, you know, we would sometimes get um, the validators of the content and country reviewers, uh, we would ask for them to have specific knowledge. So whether it was in the medical field, we needed um, somebody who had an emergency training, uh, emergency room training, or a nurse uh, or cardiologist. And, and so we would have access to them. And sometimes they would have feedback as linguists, right? Um, you know, what if the feature, you know, actually in our operating rooms, these, this doesn't work because you know, and somebody, we wouldn't even know it because we just made assumptions based on how we created the content, the source content, based on assumptions from how most hospitals work in the industrialized world. And and then sometimes these linguist feedback was not passed down to us because it was irrelevant, but, but they were so passionate about the work they were doing, they, they wanted the product to be better, especially after they've been working on our account for several years, right? Um, so I just I just started I, I learned that from uh, our account manager and I said that's wonderful like you know please share more and then you know we can all make the product better and and at the end when we launched uh, we took some of some of their feedback and and they collaborated with our research team and uh, and then eventually when when we finally launched the product because it takes a long time to run, uh, launch a, a life sciences device. Um, we send them uh, printed materials. We, you know, we couldn't send them a device, but we send them a cute video of uh, how you know uh, how long it took to get it made through production and, and then get it packaged up and ready to go out to a hospital. And and you know it's just those things that that 
help the LSP also not feel so disconnected and transactional because they're part of the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, another question. Uh, is it possible for a company to utilize both globalization and reverse innovation simultaneously? Yes, and so that's that's what uh, Professor or Dr. Uh, Govindarajan was was mentioning that oftentimes companies this is how they grow this is typically how they grow so a company like Philips and Microsoft and the large you know even Amazon probably um, they grow so big right they they expand and then there's nowhere else to grow so like their salespeople and their marketing people are going where else can we go and and the propositions that are available are not relevant to the emerging markets and so this is where they need to look at reverse innovation okay let's give those let's give those teams down in those areas the freedom to create a product that is relevant and then maybe is more nimble and different um, and then if it works then we push it the other way then we sell it in the uh, at a different price point right um, in the in the industrialized nations and and so that's typically what GE has been doing and, and Dell um, there's also a, a company in India that was a competitor to, I, I don't know if it was SAP, it was one of those uh, cloud and personalization um, solutions. So when I, you know, and, and if, if people were going to shop for at a store in India and uh, they use a lot of uh, mobile banking, right, compared to the rest of us, uh, I guess they were a little quicker to adapt. Um, so the, the, the stores would get some insights and some data collection on the types of customer and the types of times they were shopping and all the interactions they were having. And so this, this company started off in India. It was a reverse innovation uh, uh, feature that, that grew because they had a, an ability to be modular in the way they were um, doing their offering. So there were a lot of small and medium sized businesses in the US that maybe uh, now had the ability to afford a solution that was just as good as maybe a larger solution that would have been offered by SAP or one of the larger um, software companies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so given that this shift in, in product development innovation that you're talking about is likely to be really very slow, right? It's, the, the companies are going to be slow in adapting their behavior. What can we do to help accelerate this process? Uh, so I wrote to Professor Govindarajan and I asked him, I said, we're, you know, I haven't heard any, you know, any news, any other projects you're working on. It sounds like it's such, such a cool, cool thing, um, but I haven't seen it yet on any of the companies I worked at. Uh, and then, you know, I didn't get a reply yet, but I, I think, I, I think it's something that we all need to to, to just consider and maybe just it's just a matter of sharing the TED talks and sharing the material. He has a couple good books on the on the team uh -huh. on the on the subject, um, uh, but he's mostly focused on healthcare. Uh, so unfortunately, you know that's probably not as sexy as technology. Uh, it might be harder to 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 take off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, somebody here says, and rightly so, you know, talking to people is nice. Uh, but how, how do we enforce localization upstream in the product process? And how do we really become part of the product roadmap? You have a lot of experience. You've worked at different companies. What's your, what's your thinking there? So um, we honestly, it's just all about uh, uh, talking. And, and as localization people, you probably have figured out that, they're, yeah, that your different stakeholders react to different ways of communication, right? Um, we, I'm, I'm right now in, uh, in our headquarters in Amsterdam, and uh, one of my French colleagues was mentioning that uh, the Dutch people sometimes tend to joke that most of the decision making happens, you know, when they're getting coffee. Um, and if you're not getting coffee, then you might not find out why a decision was made. And I think that that is part of, uh, you know, it's one of the challenges of localization because we're never invited to to the beginning of the meeting, right? Of when somebody's pitching a new product or a new service, and and so it's your it's your job really and your responsibility to acquaint yourself with the content person, with the regulatory person, with the clinician, you know, whatever type of content you're developing, um, and the product manager and product owner, and understand. Uh, you know, it goes back to that. If you understand what, what your brand mission is, what your product is, then you will become a better contributor because you'll have better ideas. And everybody's open, you know, typically, 
two ideas. Uh, so it's really about you first need to do your homework and, and be really knowledgeable about your products and services and why you're doing what you're doing currently. And then start looking from there internally like, okay, well, my localization work is in order. Now what else can I do? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and Alessandra is just, she asked the question, she's just chiming in and saying, and rightly so, getting invited to the first meeting is really important and it's the first truly practical step, regardless of the coffee, right? <laughs> right. Being there at the inception, being there at the start and advocating at that point is really the first thing that you need to do. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, but if you just keep, uh, if you keep bringing uh, good questions and just pointing, you know, that is best practices and, and and just talking to everybody because it, it, if they remember who does, you know, if they understand, you know, maybe it'll take them seven meetings to understand what you do, <laughs> but then eventually they'll get it and they'll understand, oh, maybe I should talk, I'm writing requirements for China. Maybe I should talk to you because maybe you know something about it that I don't, right? Um, and we just avoid bugs created if we catch them earlier in the process and we even maybe change the proposition altogether because we know that China has different privacy laws. Um, yeah, but but unless we talk to each other and we say, did you already talk to this person? Did you, you know, check everything? And maybe you even reach out to your supplier because sometimes, honestly, you know, companies can't hire all the localization professionals they want, and and your supplier has seen it all sometimes. Uh -huh. and you, you, all you have to do is ask, and and they most of the times the teams that I work with are very excited to participate in, and and see a product uh, released. So yeah. And so speaking of that, I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, one person doing a million jobs. It's certainly true, uh, even in many in many client companies, that the localization team is very, very small, and they do a million things. They do QA, they do linguistic work, you know, they sometimes even do engineering on top, definitely the project management, the vendor management, the terminology management. You're now adding on to the responsibilities, right? You're you're asking them to like have a gazillion conversations on top of it, and and drive a new way of thinking about innovation. Aren't you asking a bit too much of this poor localization professional? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, I think I think honestly, uh, localization, you know, it's a high it has a high potential for burnout, and 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 I think the right, I don't want to say the right burnout, but sometimes when you're doing work that is exciting and when you feel part of a solution, um, you're also able to influence the decision making on how how impactful your work is and how to communicate that maybe you need more help, right? Like I'm, I gotta be frank with you, it, it takes time. I, I've been at Philips for almost a year and a half and, and I've been working really hard on, a, on, on making, um, you know, software internationalization a top priority and, and working with our design colleagues. And finally, just now, after a year and a half of writing requirements and emailing people all over the company, I'm finally making the right connections. But, you know, if, if, it, if localization's in your blood, I say don't give up. Uh, keep advocating for yourself, but also be smart about collecting data along the way, because this data is going to be what helps you prove your case that whether you need to hire more people to help you or that you have other capabilities and wasted talent that you're not utilizing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe you have more interests other than just doing translation. And this is a good way to, to, test, to test the waters and do other things. Yep. Uh, we have one more question here that I want to pose. Um, so re regarding the doing your homework part, you know, are there any common sources of data that help make uh, a, a business case for reverse innovation. So things like, you know, like disposable income by country, diabetes per person, per region and country, innovation scoreboard by country or language speaker. Um, if you do, if not, do you have any advice on how to define what data you need and how to get it? How do you make your case? Uh, right. I would say start looking at the, the the countries that are underperforming. So for us, let's say we translate for our adult app into 14 languages. And I got to be honest with you, only three of us have most of our users on the three of those uh, languages. And and so, it, it, you know, you have to keep asking every year, why are we translating into these other languages? Is it just inertia or are we just not delivering value? To those users because if you already address the quality of the translations issue if you already addressed internationalization then what else is missing 
Um, you know, and there's a million different things you can try, but until you start measuring and checking things off the list, so is it that the quality of the content is not relevant? Is it that you need to do transcreation instead of just translation? Um, is or, or is it you know simply that maybe there are more tech savvy? Um, you know, most of our uh, top markets are Asian countries, and they're just maybe more market savvy and more uh, more tech savvy, and they just expect more connected products, right? Uh -huh. um, so so yeah, it it varies, but I'd say start collecting start being more um diligent about how you collect data and how you first keep track of the very basics of your localization program which are always you know terminology quality um you know lead times and then and then start asking more about okay which are the countries that are just not performing and why and and sometimes that's partnering with market uh with the markets uh, marketing and sales and customer care you know when we get complaints what are they complaining about the product the relevance of a product or the translation and sometimes it's not clear you have to dig deeper to find out mm -hmm. so essentially you're working with company internal data to make your case right okay and that yeah. data of course needs to be available first um, any outside right. sources that you would recommend the localization professionals should uh, consult um, well, I'm I'm a big fan. We used to have a, a membership to CSA, so I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of their the research. Uh, I think they 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 have invaluable uh, a lot of research available on different things that you can't even think about. I think they came up with a, even a calculator of uh, you know whether to create a business case to go into a, into a country, which mm -hmm. I think is something pretty new. Um, yeah, uh, and and there are a lot of a lot of large companies also already have access to research firms like Forrester, right? And like all these things, but sometimes the marketing, the product marketing team is so overburdened too that nobody's helping them ask these questions. And so it's just a matter of partnering better with them and saying, where are you trying to go, right? Like what is in our roadmap in the next five years? Are we trying to conquer the world, right? Are we trying to fix things? Because the priorities will change. So how can I be a better partner in the localization? Feel whether are we cutting costs? Are we, you know, trying to launch new things? Um, and then that will help you guide your decision making and your budget allocation and and how much people, how many people you need and, and how much resources. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, thanks for that. Um, my, the questions are coming in. It, it seems kind of a little. And I wouldn't say randomly, uh, but I, I just saw one that was posted earlier that just popped up now. Um, and it's it's Edith Bendamaha just asking or saying, you also need to embed globalization into the strategy for a product or company. So discuss with the product managers first before you discuss with engineering, which I think is very true. Right? Is there anything you want to add to that or? No, no, I totally agree uh, because, you know, often we, we joke that uh, engineering is really at the execution phase and, and it's true. And sometimes we don't really bother to ask the question, is this the right approach? Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Too late. Mm -hmm. yep. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think I don't see any more questions that relate to this particular topic here at the moment. So I want to uh, thank you, Dortha, for um, for talking to us about this and approaching the subject matter, because I think it is surely on the mind of many people working in client companies. But you know, they I think they never take the time and ask themselves, you know, how do I really improve? You know, how do I really <laughs> reach out to uh, underperforming markets? You know, and uh, is there any learning that we can bring to this and any changes that we can uh, affect? So thank you very much for, for taking this on and talking to us uh, about this today. Yeah, thank you for the time and, uh, and, and thank you all for the friendly discussion. Uh, this was my master thesis, as I said, and so it was, it was a little hard to repurpose uh, without trying to clutter you with too much information. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And uh, we will not have a webinar next week or the following week because it's Look World and then TC World, um, but we will have uh, one in three weeks from now then. And to all of you in the United States, uh, happy Halloween. Um, and uh, if you could could just take a moment, please, uh, to fill out the post-event survey that's coming up right after we hang up. It is short, uh, but your perspectives really help us to refine our webinar program. And with that, I wish you a good evening, Dorothy in Amsterdam, uh, and a good day wherever you may be. Bye-bye.